welcome. Good morning. We're glad you all made it to our new location. You'll be here for the rest of the academic year, so you can get reused to this room. Today we are very fortunate to have one of our own faculty members here, one of the house staff's favorite teachers ever, to give us a green rounds talk. Dr. David O. graduated from University of Chicago for undergrad, and he stayed in the area to go to Pritzker School of Medicine for his MD, and then did his residency at the University Hospitals of Cleveland before moving here to Seattle, where he got his MS in epidemiology and did fellowships in health services research and development, as well as pulmonary and critical care medicine. And he's currently a professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care at our VA. He is an educator who many of us know quite well. He's mentored several pulmonary critical care fellows as well as fellowship-bound residents. He also attends quite frequently on the VA NICU, where many of us know him from. He attends with residents and fellows in pulmonary clinic at the VA, and he also teaches med students in their senior pulmonary critical care medicine elective. And of course, he does quite a bit of research. His primary research area is in chronic lung disease, specifically those diseases related to tobacco use. But he also has grants pertaining to a variety of other topics, including patient adherence to therapy, outcomes in older patients, EMRs, hospital readmissions. So today he's going to talk to us about what many of us know him best for, which is the topic of COPD. And his talk today is entitled, How Are We Doing at Delivering High-Quality COPD Care? Welcome, Dr. Oppen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. I'm actually quite happy to be here, and I actually really appreciate all the friendly faces I see in the audience, um, especially from my own division. I appreciate that. Some of which we'll actually hear. Uh, I've given some of these slides before, so there'll, there'll be some redundancy for them. Uh, I was told I was supposed to have disclosure, so I just threw these up. I have uh, research funding from uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the v uh, NHLBI ARC, and Gilead Sciences. So um, just some quick COPD facts. Um, it's an important disease for the US. It affects roughly between 12 and 24 million Americans. It's a wide variance, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, probably about two to three million Americans have severe disease. Uh, payers of healthcare really care about COPD because it costs the US about $49 billion in direct and indirect costs. Uh, within the VA where I practice, um, VA is, uh, COPD is about four times more common uh, than the U.S. general populations, just in part related to uh, tobacco use. It's an important cause of death and disability that's actually not changing, right? I mean, and this is data that just came out, thank you very much, from the uh, JAMA and, um, uh, just a couple weeks ago. And basically it shows that uh, if you look at the uh, leading causes of years uh, life lost, uh, COPD has gone from the fifth in 1990 to the fourth in uh, 2010. It's gone from about 97 million, uh, I'm sorry, 97,000 deaths per year to about 154,000, a, a change of about uh, 60%. It's the leading, um, it's the, of the major causes. It's uh, had the largest jump in uh, number of deaths. Uh, it's only really related to lung cancer, right, which is also a smoking-related lung disease, so um, uh, areas that we're not doing particularly well in. If you, if you add uh, years of life loss plus disability, you get disability-adjusted life years, and uh, COPD started uh, down here uh, at number three, and now it's number two, uh, and it's gone from a median rank of um, uh, th roughly uh, 3.9 to 2.5, a change of 34%. So uh, an issue that's actually not uh, changing uh, over uh, multiple decades of time. I'm going to change gears a little bit to say that inhaled uh, medications uh, are really now the cornerstone of therapies for COPD. Um, you know, I would say 15, 20 years ago, there was not a rich efficacy base of data uh, about the use of these medications and the effects of these medications. And that's really changed. Uh, medications such as LABAs, inhaled corticosteroids, LAMAs, um, we know have no mortality benefit, uh, but they do have uh, important outcomes for um, patient-centered, what I would consider patient-centered outcomes, and that includes modest improvements in quality of life, as well as um, uh, really uh, uh, high-quality evidence for decreasing COPD exacerbation risks. These are all done in the settings of efficacy studies that are really artificial constructs, as we might remember, and I'll go through this in a second. The classic efficacy study is the placebo-controlled trial. And as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, they have uh, 
efficacy trials are great because they have a high degree of internal validity. So when we're asking the question about whether or not uh, a, a medication or an intervention works in the ideal environment, this is the study designed to ask it in. Um, but the research infrastructure does not emulate the real world. Um, it, because it just simply doesn't exist, right? In, in, efficacy studies, in efficacy studies, there are research coordinators that encourage medication use, for example. Um, the, uh, you know, most studies actually assume the cost of care for both medication and acquisition costs as well as other issues. Most efficacy studies have medication adherence programs that don't exist in real world settings. Um, there are uh, in, in efficacy studies, there's one intervention versus, you know, multiple uh, medications that um, they can have as well as um, uh, competing uh, um, classes of medications. Um, and especially for pulmonary medicine, where uh, medications are delivered by inhaled routes as opposed to um, uh, oral pills, there is a heterogeneous adoption of instructions of actually how to use these medications. And, and the recent rage in, in pulmonary medicine or pulmonary pharmaceutical development has been the development of not new drugs but new delivery devices, which allows them, which allows companies to extend their patents and their profitability. Uh, efficacy studies provide different information than effectiveness studies. So effectiveness studies are really designed uh, in, to provide a spectrum of evidence. And they really ask questions around how well do proven therapies, uh, those that are known to be efficacious, actually work in real life populations. So they talk about um, real world situations, they talk about heterogeneous populations, and there are many, many reasons why therapies that are known to be effic efficacious in, uh, in uh, clinical trials are not effective in real, in real practice. And they include things such as costs, side effects, comorbid conditions. Uh, effectiveness studies come in, in a couple of varieties, observational studies or clinical trials. Um, and if we, as we think about this uh, context in the context of the NIH kind of model of research translation, most of us think about T1 research as research that goes from the bench to the bedside, taking T2 research, taking those uh, information we learned at the bedside and, and applying it to uh, patients in the form of clinical trials, and then taking that information here from efficacy research, applying it through to practice um, in, the, in the form of T3 research. Uh, if we, in this context, T2 research actually focuses on innovation. Uh, does do we can, can we deliver new therapies to uh, patients? Um, can we be at the cutting edge of, of therapies? T3 research is really about improving uh, health, and uh, that's how I, I conceptualize it, at least. That, uh, and much of the talk today will be about this area right here, about how we take this evidence that we know exists uh, through T2 research and applying it into. Uh, um, to apply to improve uh, overall health. There's a lot of, um, so I wanted to take a, uh, a moment just to kind of talk about what opportunity exists in real world information. Um, there's, there's no better, uh, um, there's no environment more real than, than the real world, than the clinical, uh, than the clinical world. The clinical context has patient factors uh, that include clinical associated demographic factors, patient provider factors such as quality care, healthcare systems, barriers and facilitators to implementing high quality care. When we're trying to make inferences between an exposure and outcome that is mechanistic in nature, it's, it's, it's obviously uh, difficult sometimes with issues of confounding, confounding by indication and the like. But if we're looking, if we're using that data to actually make inferences about delivery of care, um, then that information actually is, is probably more valid. And it presents really opportunities to ask questions that can never otherwise be um, asked. And it definitely has implications for quality and processes of care. And so I bring this up because a lot of what we're going to be talking about is, is observational data uh, that's, uh, that's examining these two, these two issues. There are good examples already in the literature for COPD. This is a, Peter, this is a paper by Peter Lindenauer in the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, from 2006 that basically looked at the examination of quality of care for patients in, admitted to hospital uh, for COPD exacerbations. And basically what he showed was that for any individual um, uh, quality measure, uh, the individual adoption of each any individual measure was actually quite high, but that when you lump them together, uh, only about 66% of people actually received what you would consider recommended care. And if you combine that with 
uh, you know, care that people received that were actually not recommended. Only about, really about uh, 35 or 40 percent of people received what he would consider to be ideal care, right? So this is already data back from 2006. Um, and then I also wanted to provide a little bit of a clinical context for the majority of this talk is that, as, uh, as you know, I practice within the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, it's a great opportunity to practice there because it's the largest vertically integrated healthcare system in the United States. We care for approximately four to five million veterans in primary care settings. We think about, about a million of them have COPD. Uh, the VA has a uh, hub-and-spoke model for delivery of care. Primary care is delivered in diverse community-based settings, um, both on this side of the mountains and that side of the mountains. Um, um, and specialty care, such as myself, is typically concentrated within larger uh, urban environments. Um, the integration actually provides a lot of opportunity to coordinate activities between multiple providers, but there are certain barriers that still remain, including cultural differences between primary care and specialty care in terms of how we vision taking care of patients, uh, priorities between different groups, right? My priorities are probably not going to be the same as, you know, Dr. Finn's priorities. The organizational uh, priorities between, um, there are organizational priorities between specialty and primary care leadership as well, right? So what might be important for VA leadership and specialty care may not be the same priority for primary care. And so these present challenges for delivery of ideal care. And, um, and so in framed from a patient perspective, I would think that ideal care is really just providing the care that benefits uh, a, a person's health, regardless of who is, that, who is providing that health, uh, that health care. So this is an example. This is our Vizin, Vizin 20, with Seattle and Portland being the two 1A facilities. They're small, smaller facilities in Boise, uh, on Spokane. Uh, but you can see that we cover a large geographic area, and we're um, a relatively few pulmonologists are responsible for a large um, uh, number of patients as well as uh, that are kind of uh, you know scattered throughout the uh, throughout the region. So as we think about uh, how to frame a conceptual uh, model for providing high quality care, I, uh, I typically come back to the IHI model, which is called the triple aim. Uh, it's a way to, to think about delivery of healthcare in quality settings uh, and quality of healthcare delivery, um, really focusing on three at aspects, uh, population health, uh, patient experiences, and per capita costs. And you actually have to balance all three of them uh, to, ha to have high quality uh, care. And, and so specifically for a framework for COPD, though, um, I, I think about different, different stages of COPD, kind of starting at pre-diagnosis, so these are people who might be just be smoking, pre-diagnosis, so people who actually have disease, uh, but we don't recognize that they have disease or they don't have a diagnosis. At the time of diagnosis, um, uh, around disease management itself, and then, and then as, um, as we all approach death, um, you know, um, so at each of these kind of phases of, of COPD, um, there really has to be some organizational factors, and these kind of relate to the, uh, the structure, uh, the physical and personnel of healthcare uh, that exists to support uh, delivery of care for these patients. Uh, it includes provider behavior, it improves uh, costs, um, and, and we have other factors down here that include patient characteristics, severity of disease, social determinants of health, the like. And these actually have to be integrated together in order to prov provide high quality care uh, within the, um, um, uh, to produce high quality outcomes. Um, otherwise, you know, this in absence of this uh, doesn't do us much good and uh, patient factors alone without organizational factors probably doesn't uh, do us much good as well. So these, two, these factors have to be integrated to produce high quality care. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on really three areas. The use of spirometry in terms of the accuracy of diagnosis, uh, exacerbation, relapse, uh, prevention, and organizational structure uh, that exists within at least the Department of Veterans Affairs and, and a little bit of UW um, uh, for um, COPD care. So how good is healthcare delivery for patients with COPD? I think um, a lot of it depends on, so quality depends on getting the diagnosis correct. Um, it, it means getting treatments that are correct and delivering when it matters. Um, there are a number of organizations uh, that have perf developed performance measures, including NCQA, CMS, NQF. Um, and they've all endorsed performance measures to benchmark quality of care, and so we'll focus on those particular benchmarks. So the first thing we'll do is focus on getting the diagnosis correct and getting the treatments correct. And so why start a diagnosis? 
Um, well, I think it's fundamental that if you're going to actually improve delivery of care for a patients with a set of diseases, you actually have to make sure that they actually have the disease of interest. It's important to point out that COPD is a diagnosis that is not made solely by history and physical findings alone. Certainly, they contribute, but the uh, but the essence of COPD is uh, the detection of airflow limitation that is not fully reversible. We know that spirometry, despite being an NQF measure, is, is underutilized. We know that spirometry is a simple, uh, relatively easy to perform. It's guideline recommended, as I just mentioned. Um, and there have been multiple studies that have demonstrated limited uptake of spirometry in primary care settings. Typically, it's around 30 to 50 percent of patients who carry a diagnosis of COPD uh, actually receive spirometry. And there have been national programs uh, sponsored by the NHL and the like, including like the Lung Health uh, Education Program, uh, that started in Denver. Um, and that actually encouraged spirometry use. And they did this in a way that, that actually made a lot of sense. Uh, they went to primary care clinics. They provided spirometers for free. Uh, they actually taught providers how to bill for spirometers. And then they went back and, and looked to see how many, you know, how the rate of uptake for spirometry use was. And they, by and large, the spirometers were sitting in the corner of the office collecting dust, um, and not being used at all. And so, so even, even with good intentions, it's hard to, uh, to change provider behavior. <laughs> Um, and so one of the questions we were asking is, why is spirometry uptake so poor in primary care settings? And so Min Ju, who's at the, actually at University of Illinois Chicago, uh, did a series of focus groups with primary care providers. And she actually asked questions of spirometry use. And she, she, she identified kind of four domains uh, of interest. One was around pre-existing diagnosis, so patients uh, who had previous diagnosis of COPD, patients who were suspected of having COPD, uh, the prioritization of COPD during a primary care visits, and patient health system issues uh, for the use of spirometry. These are things that are all derived out of qualitative analyses. And so basically what she found was that um, if, if someone comes to you and they already have a diagnosis of COPD, uh, primary care providers didn't actually feel like they needed to uh, do spirometry to confirm it. Um, this is a quote to support it, which would be, uh, I wouldn't go through the whole if they've had spirometry, if they've had PFTs um, done or not. I feel like it's reasonable, if it's a reasonable history, I'm not really sure I'd go back and reinvent the wheel, right? So this kind of shows the, the attitude that if they have a diagnosis of COPD, I'm not really going to bother to kind of confirm that that diagnosis is right. They also don't think that you actually need to have spirometry in the, in the context of patients suspected of having COPD. So if my patient is coughing a lot, they have dyspnea, they have exertion, they've smoked a lot, they wheeze, I almost don't care what the PFT shows. If I give them uh, Atrovent or Spireva and they feel uh, a lot better, I'm going to keep them on, uh, I'm going to keep it on even if PFTs uh, show an FEV1 to uh, VC ratio of 79, 74, or 76. And these, are, these people almost certainly don't have uh, COPD, right? But they don't care. Right? They're just going to give them meds, and if they make them feel better, then good. They're going to continue on. Um, so primary care providers actually prioritize other diseases more than, than COPD, right? And that might be appropriate. Um, we, we see a lot of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia uh, in our practice. If, uh, uh, if patients really don't have many complaints, I tend to deal with these chronic diseases first rather than COPD. So it just, it just kind of shows that if, you know, if um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in primary care on these conditions, appropriately so, but COPD is, is clearly under, under prioritized. And then they have some health system barriers where they, they have the perception that you know, spirometry is difficult to obtain, spirometry is uh, expensive to obtain, they have to take time, patients have to take time off from their, um, uh, from work and the like, and, um, and hence it's a, there are barriers to actually obtaining uh, spirometry. So what's the, what's the effect of not obtaining spirometry among patients who we think actually have COPD? So we went and interrogated um, uh, pulmonary function test uh, machines from three centers in, in VISN20. Um, and we identified a cohort of patients who had one or more of the following. So they had two or more outpatients visits for COPD, treatment for a COPD exacerbation, or active treatment for COPD. And we excluded patients who we thought would have competing issues, such as lung cancer, nodules, asthma. And we identified about 5,600 patients who had a diagnosis of COPD um, through, these, through these criteria. And if, if you look at uh, 
And then if you look to see actually how many of those people had airflow limitation uh, by, um, by spirometry, only about half did. That means if you're looking at a population of patients who's actively being treated for COPD, about your prior probability of being correct is only about 50%. It's not very good. And these are people who are not just the one COPD visit. These are people who are being actively treated or who have had multiple visits for COPD, OK? And then, by the way, this is a work of Bridget Collins, who's actually in the back room right there. And if you look at the selected predictors of, of airflow limitation, there are really only three things that actually predict whether or not you have airflow obstruction. And these you might expect, right? Um, smoking, that seems like a no-brainer. Uh, being underweight. Uh, and then the number of COPD exacerbations. Everything else actually, um, you know, is you're less likely actually to have COPD, right? The one thing I'm really impressed about in terms of the number of COPD exacerbations is that this is the number of COPD exacerbations. So every time you have a COPD exacerbation, you only have about a 10%, uh, you know, 10% higher risk of having COPD, right? It's not very high. So if you have, you know, four COPD exacerbations, you're only 40% more likely to have airflow limitation than, than not. So it's, uh, it's um, the predictors are not, are not great. The, actually, the, the greater number of comorbidities you have uh, is a very strong predictor of whether or not you actually have COPD. So by the time you have uh, uh, five or more comorbidities, you're, you're, you're much less likely to actually have COPD than, um, than not. If, and like I said, these are people who carry diagnosis COPD who are being treated. So, and what happens if um, uh, diagnosis of COPD were not confirmed? Well, um, there are a lot of common uh, conditions associated with COPD, certainly lack of exercise, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and they all have kind of common symptoms that include dyspnea, wheezing, exercise intolerance, right? So there's some degree of misclassification going on here. And if I'm just going to focus on obesity for a moment, which is, you know, in context of Steve Kahn's talk last week, and uh, obesity is a, is a problem in the United States, as we all know. Um, you know, the percent of people who have uh, very large BMIs is quite high. And so um, this is also data from Bridget Collins. And, um, uh, and we were asking questions about the effect of obesity on the clinical diagnosis of, of COPD. And so we changed the definition of the cohort that I described a, a little bit. Uh, and these are people who just had a clinical diagnosis of COPD by ICD-9 codes. And again, we excluded uh, pulmonary disorders such as asthma, ILD, and bronchiectasis. Um, and we assessed uh, receipt of inhaled medications before and after spirometry to see whether or not there were changes in, proceed, uh, in, in treatment after um, um, uh, spirometry, which we would expect to have. And basically what we find is that as your BMI category increases, the diseases that we would expect to have, such as you know, heart failure, depression, diabetes, sleep apnea, hypertension, all go up, right? Um, but that uh, the, the proportion of people who actually have airflow limitation actually goes down, right? It starts at around 67% for people who, who, have, uh, who are um, um, you know, normal weight uh, down to um, uh, 30% for people who are, are morbidly obese. The likelihood of, of being treated also goes up, um, despite having um, um, uh, being heavy. So, if you look at by proportion of patients with airflow obstruction by BMI category, by the time you really get to a BMI category of obesity, so above 30 uh, percent, uh, the the proportion of people who actually have airflow obstruction is is really in the neighborhood of about 40, 30. You know, 30, high 30s, low 40 percent range, so that the vast majority of people who are at this range of obesity actually don't have COPD at all. Um, and the next step, the next question was, well, if they don't have COPD, then do we follow up with that? Do we actually appropriately de-escalate therapy, or do we appropriately escalate therapy uh, thereafter? And it turns out, the heavier you are, the less likely you are to de-escalate, and the heavier you are, the more likely you are to escalate. And so these are both inappropriate actions, uh, but they're more likely to happen for obese patients. We also know, so these are patients actually with COPD, and this is uh, data from Laura Ciceri, now Feimster, um, who, um, where, you know, for any level of uh, airflow limitation, uh, patients report greater degrees of uh, dyspnea. So these are obese patients here reporting greater dyspnea. They also report worse health status. 
Um, they're also more likely to get inhaled uh, uh, long-acting bronchodilators, uh, LABAs in particular, and inhaled corticosteroids. So, they're, so they're, they have worse symptoms, uh, they have uh, worse health-related quality of life, and they're more likely to get treated for any level of uh, airflow limitation. So um, obesity's effect on COPD is, uh, it really does lead to a greater degree of, uh, of misdiagnosis. And among those without airflow limitation, they're actually more likely to escalate therapy and they're less likely to stop uh, medications appropriately. Among patients with COPD, for every level of severity of airflow limitation, uh, they have worse dyspnea, health status, and more medications. It's an, and it's an important contributor of receipt of inhaled therapies. Um, they also have worse exercise tolerance and worse, um, worse end exercise dyspnea and show that data. But I think of obesity this way. Is it, obesity is a mimicker of COPD, right? If we think about who, who um, is often obese, they're, top of, they're typically a little bit older. We all get a little bit heavier as we get older. Um, they're often current or past smokers. It's, just, it's associated with poor health habits. It uh, presents with insidious onset of shortness of breath, exercise tolerance, and wheezing symptoms. Um, and this is a slide I, I pulled off the, the web, and it's, uh, it's in a language I don't know. Uh, but, um, uh, but I think it illustrates nicely that here we have this young guy who's hip and cool, smoking away. And, um, and then as he gets a little bit older, I assume this is age over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's, he, it's, um, he's having a little bit harder time climbing stairs, and then he's hard, having a hard time keeping up with people. And then I assume this is death as well. It's red, and it's at the end, and it looks bad. So I assume that's death. Um, but if you think about, and this is really classic for COPD, but if you think about the effects of obesity, it can maybe actually be quite similar. Right? And I do think it's important to tell them apart. This is a, poison, a poisonous coral snake uh, that looks similar to a uh, scarlet king snake, uh, which is not poisonous. Um, and so the implications, um, inhaled therapies are really designed to improve airflow limitation, and it doesn't really work for obesity or other common comorbid diseases. Uh, there are large opportunity costs uh, that, are not that are not appropriately being focused on uh, the primary etiology of disease. Uh, bronchodilators have no benefit toward cardiovascular disease risk, for example, um, and there are multiple observational studies uh, that show adverse cardiac associations with bronchodilators. We know in, in well-controlled, randomized control trials that uh, uh, inhaled corticosteroid use uh, increases your risk of pneumonia by about 25%. Um, it leads to unnecessary medical expenditures, uh, in particular with COPD visits. These medications that we give people are not cheap. Um, and um, it's not patient-centered, right? I mean, we're assigning a disease to someone who actually doesn't have a disease, and that is that not, um, you know, um, a definition of patient-centered care. So I'm going to transition a little bit to um, getting the treatments correct and delivering care when it matters, and I'm going to use uh, COPD exacerbation as the model there. We know that it's common, and it decreases health related quality of life and senses of well-being. They're potentially life-threatening. Um, to the payer, to the health system, it's really expensive, and most importantly, it's actually modifiable. Um, we know that exacerbation relapse is a time-sensitive event. This is data from uh, Hearst Group in, in um, the UK. It basically shows that uh, your, your probability of relapse occurs highest in, in, a, in a time frame around 12 to eight, uh, 8 to 12 weeks after the initial exacerbation. And I think this actually presents an opportunity to, uh, to act in, in this time frame. We also know that for people who are actually admitted to hospital that it's, it's common, 190,000, um, but that when you have a COPD readmission that it's actually more expensive uh, than the initial admission. If a COPD contributes to the readmission, it's even more expensive and all cause readmissions is even more expensive, right? So it's, it's a common problem, it's a costly problem, and it's one that's modifiable. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, a, a meta-analysis done by Mills uh, that looked at pharmacologic um, effects of, um, uh, um, pharmacologic effects of medications on, on um, exacerbation risk. And basically, um, you can give anyone anything and it will reduce the risk of exacerbation. I mean, that's really the take-home point. The, the, the effect is, uh, is comparable to the effect you would expect to see for beta blockers and heart failure risk, ACE inhibitors and heart failure readmission. So the, the effect size is comparable. Um, and these are, these are studies that are, at least these in this kind of 
uh, category up here in terms of lavas, llamas, and ICS, we're talking about tens of thousands of people who have contributed uh, to this evidence base. So it's a high quality evidence base. And so we actually asked, and this is a uh, work of Ann Melzer, um, who's currently a fellow in our program, um, whether or not patients within the visit actually receive um, appropriate uh, escalation of therapy after COPD exacerbations. And so we identified a cohort using uh, um, an algorithm we developed with uh, Colin Cook, who is here, obviously chief resident here, fellow here, and is now at University of Michigan. Um, and we actually identified a, a large cohort of about 45,000 patients and identified after these patients came in uh, whether or not they had a COPD exacerbation. And we defined them in either in the outpatient setting or the inpatient setting. And we identified about 2,500 of them. And then we asked about, um, we, identif we went through and asked of these patients who had these COPD exacerbations, how many of them had an opportunity to actually change therapy, either to escalate therapy, um, either with an inhaled corticosteroid or a long acting beta agonist. And, um, and we looked at a time frame about six months after the COPD exacerbation. So we were trying to be generous with time, right? Um, I showed data to suggest that we really want to act quickly, but, but we were trying to be generous with time. And we assessed uh, uh, medications, like I mentioned, that modify COPD uh, exacerbation risk, including lava, inhaled corticosteroids, or both. And then we looked at some predictors as well. And basically what we found was that of the, of the 2,500 patients or so who had um, a COPD exacerbation, really about two-thirds had no change in their therapy whatsoever, even after six months of time. Um, the predictors um, were things that you might expect. Uh, comorbidity was important. Um, actually, COP COPD exacerbation was a little bit surprising to me, as well as uh, ipitromine bromide and SABA canisters. But there were, um, but if you look at these in terms of uh, adjusted risk, uh, in terms of uh, uh, odds, there's nothing here that actually increased your odds of actually receiving appropriate therapy. Everything predicted uh, not receiving therapy, right? So um, it's interesting, even smoking status, right, that you might think you might want to escalate their therapy, that was actually a strong predictor of not actually escalating therapy appropriately. So we found that, you know, that there was relatively low adoption of uh, treatments that we know modify exacerbation risk. Um, there was low use of uh, inhaled cork steroids and LAVAs. Uh, that it, um, that's even after um, uh, exacerbation, 65% of people did not have appropriate escalation. There are important predictors. I didn't show you the inpatient data, but they're pretty consistent. You know, age, CHF, prior CPD exacerbation, depression, things really related around comorbidities. And so... So we asked, why are these prescription rates so low? And, and in part, are there organizational structures to help support um, high quality care within the healthcare delivery system? Um, we actually asked questions around, what is the support uh, that exists for patients with COPD? And this is, uh, I'll show you this, I'll come back to a second. Uh, there is, uh, is there evidence uh, for organizational emphasis to improve COPD delivery of care, uh, really through the support of clinical reminders, through the adoption of quality improvement processes like measurement and dissemination, um, and really, can we look to see whether or not there's um, differential organizational interest and how that organizational interest might result in the, in the results that we just saw. And in particular, we're going to focus on heart failure. So this was, we did studies, we did a study that's uh, in the context of a larger study that's designed to look at the relationship between organizational structure, uh, the availability of resources and QI programs and hospital readmissions. And so for this, we actually did a cross-sectional survey where we uh, surveyed the chiefs of medicines or cardiologies uh, back in 2008 about heart failure practices. So this was a little while ago. We actually engaged the national program director for cardiology, who was Bob Jesse at the time. And um, he, uh, on his, uh, you know, under his letterhead, we sent out this survey and uh, to 144 facilities, and we had 100% response rate. Uh, in 2012, we, because there was no separate measure developed for uh, CHF, we developed our own measure, and I'll show you that in a second. But um, we, uh, we sent a, a similar survey using the chief of medicine or, um, or a pulmonary under the letterhead of uh, Peter Almanoff, who is the national program director for um, uh, uh, pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at the time. We sent it to 102 facilities and had a response rate of 93%, uh, which is still, I consider, quite good. 
And the survey was really designed to address organizational resources available for both heart failure and COPD. We wanted to address um, the, the use of quality improvement processes for heart failure and COPD. We wanted to, we developed the survey, or the CHF survey was actually developed by a group called IHD, or CHF Query, uh, which is a group within VA that's focused on uh, improving delivery of care. Um, uh, for patients with heart failure. Um, because we knew we were going to make comparisons, we actually developed a COPD survey to parallel the heart failure survey. Uh, but we used measures that were endorsed by NQF and NCQA. And, and what we found was that for specialty-driven organizational structure, there was a lot of similarities. So there was, you know, um, facilities that reported a, a cardiologist or pulmonologist were pretty similar. Uh, at those facilities, there, were, there was a little tendency to have more cardiologists. Um, in clinics that specialized specifically on heart failure or COPD, there was actually a pretty big difference. 44% of facilities reported a heart failure um, uh, clinic versus only 12% for uh, COPD. But otherwise, it was pretty similar. There was the same number of cardiologists and pulmonologists who focused on that disease. Uh, and for standardized practices for outpatient management, um, programs around disease self-management were the same, education programs were about the same, and exercise programs were about the same. So things that pulmonologists would, act, would have a tendency of driving were about the same as what you'd expect for, uh, as toward cardiology-driven um, emphasis. But if you look at primary care, um, it, it's, there's a lot of differences. So the availability of pharmacists, for example, for uh, CHF versus COPD is actually quite different. 54, 51% of uh, uh, facility uh, leaders reported um, having a pharmacist that, would, that, you could, um, that was dedicated for or um, who knew about C, uh, CHF care versus only 30% for COPD. Home monitoring programs differ widely, um, and, and the method of... Um, it didn't matter the method of uh, home monitoring. Um, whether or not they routinely shared uh, disease-related performance measures, 62% uh, of the time in 2008 reported CHF, but only 17% uh, in, in 2012 reported it. So big differences in organizational structure. The availability of computerized outpatient reminders in primary care uh, were also similar. So uh, sort of COPD, for example, corticosteroid uh, reminders to use corticosteroids, only 17%, confirmation of airflow limitations, 35%, uh, assigning, uh, assessing signs and symptoms of respiratory failure, only 20%. In contrast to reminding people to use ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and measuring ejection factor were all substantially higher. Um, we also looked, we also asked questions around hospital admission and discharge uh, practices, uh, and in particular around uh, measuring whether or not they measured pre-discharge uh, quality. Um, and there is a strong organizational emphasis toward heart failure, right, in terms of measuring LVEF, using ACE inhibitors, using beta blockers, spironolactones, statins, spironolactone, which was even that common at the time. But if you look at COPD, it's much different, you know, only 32% for um, confirmation of spirometry, assessment of severity. Uh, adequate duration of oral corticosteroid use. The only things that they did really well on were co confirming that um, you know, people were not hypoxemic and patients uh, um, were uh, not um, were actually assessing uh, smoking status. Uh, but I would actually, I would point out that these two measures are actually really not COPD specific, right? They're JCO measures. They're they're actually things that have been so ingrained into the system that they're just done automatically. They're, so. And this is what I like the most about this slide, so we, uh, about this talk, which is that well, we looked at the, we asked people about the time reported for patients uh, at discharge about these different topics, right? And if you look at activity levels, discharge medications, follow-up appointments, smoking, the, the fact that so many more people reported that they had no idea, you know, they don't know whether or not there's any discussions about going on about activity level, uh, discharge medications, uh, follow-up, is just distinctly higher for uh, uh, COPD than it is for heart failure. And what I find even more amazing is that if you look at the, t you know, what, you know, these are counseling at the time of discharge, what do you do if your symptoms worsen, right? 96% uh, of facility people reported that they spent no time talking about, talking with patients about what to do if their symptoms worsen versus uh, obviously a clear difference for, for heart failure. I mean, for a facility person to report this, I would almost expect them to lie before reporting nothing, right? <laughs> um, but, uh, but, and I've gone back and looked at this data, and it's right. Um, and then in, uh, as this kind of continues on, in terms of you know, providing educational materials for patients, um, it's, uh, it's, it's equally uh, different. <laughs> so 
So I do think that there is a strong organizational def uh, strong difference in organizational emphasis. And I really do think that COPD really appears to be the Rodney Danger field of chronic diseases. <laughs> you know, where it's the second leading cause of disability adjusted life years. It's a leading cause of hospital readmission, right? Or hospital admission and readmission. It's really tied for heart failure uh, in terms of medical admissions. Um, and yet, I really do feel like there's a limited organizational interest in, in this particular disease. And I think it provides some insight into why we find that the use of spirometry is so poor in uh, primary care clinics and as well as the lack of appropriate escalation of uh, treatments after exacerbations because it's not been uh, measured and it's not been uh, endorsed. So how are we doing at UW? Right, so so this is all within VA, right? And so you might be thinking, well, that's a VA problem. Um, and so Laura Feimster actually, um, uh, through in preparation for K, um, K award actually audited. Uh, she identified uh, 50 patients, or she identified a cohort of patients uh, in GIMC here, who had COPD, and then randomly uh, audited uh, 50 charts. And what she found was actually not that different, right? She found that uh, spirometry within three years, uh, only about 64%. Uh, a diagnosis that confirmed, uh, that was confirmed by spirometry, only about 48%. This is exactly the same as the VA, by the way. Um, in terms of smoking ses uh, assessment, pretty good, 84%, but not great. Um, counseling or referral, only 70%. Pharma you know, whether or not they offer pharmaceutical uh, therapies, only 27%. Uh, they did really well looking for hypoxemia. They did really bad in terms of referring symptomatic patients for pulmonary rehab, which we have, uh, you know, uh, within the organization. Um, you know, inhaled therapies for COPD, was, we did quite well. But if we needed to escalate therapies for COPD, uh, it looks like we did better than uh, than the VA, but not that much better. So. So Laura's actually proposed as part of her K, uh, K23 uh, uh, an intervention called uh, FACES, right? Facilitating adoption of COPD evidence-based care in outpatient settings. And she's engaged um, both Roosevelt and Harborview clinics. Um, she's going to use an interrupted time series design, which is amenable to this type of uh, intervention. But the intervention really focuses on quality measures. And, and she as a pulmonologist and, and me as a pulmonologist are going to try to interface at the primary care level uh, to try to help with population management of the of of the, of, um, the population. Uh, Laura's going to do a lot of academic detailing um, uh, with providers and then um, really try to facilitate manage by, by providing orders and other type of suggestions for um, um, you know, delivery of care for these patients. Uh, really trying to be synchronous at the time of primary care visits to synchronize uh, when these uh, suggestions come when, when patients are actually in the primary care clinics. So, so so who would have thought? I mean, I, I really do think, you know, I've been, you know, as you know, I've been at the University of Washington now for a long time. I've been interested in COPD for a long time. And I really do feel like I'm here, um, right? Um, uh, in terms of really improving delivery of care, right? I haven't shown you anything about improving delivery of care. All I've shown you is what the current state is now. Um, and so I really do feel like we are, we are here. Um, we've made recommendations. I've made recommendations to VA. Um, to try to encourage uh, higher quality COPD care. I mean, the first issue is that we actually can't measure quality of care because we actually have no way of integrating uh, pulmonary function data uh, into our current data structures. And so there's actually no way to actually know, aside from chart review and the like, about whether or not we can, you know, um, uh, whether or not we're actually delivering high quality care. I actually do think we have to uh, facilitate adoption of high quality practices in primary care settings. Uh, I think we, I, it's you know it's it's remarkable to me that um, that if we don't measure something, it actually doesn't happen, right? And so I actually do think we actually have to develop performance measures that that really focus around the accuracy of diagnosis, appropriate first line therapies, appropriate de-escalation medications for patients who don't have COPD, um, and escalate treatments uh, for patient for people who are having exacerbations, right? These are these are low hanging fruit that I think we can actually intervene on. Um, I think we I think we as pulmonologists need to actually interact better with uh, primary care staffing in terms of nursing and pharmacy as well as well. Um, this is, a, I mean, I think in the, in the era of uh, ACA and ACOs, um, I do think, you know, as integrated healthcare systems, I actually wonder what my responsibility is as a pulmonologist. And I don't know if it's just related only to those patients who are referred to me in the outpatient setting or whether or not I need to be involved at a uh, population management level. And I actually 
think that it should probably be at a population uh, management level. And that uh, I actually think that we should probably be scanning um, um, the population looking for patients who we can actually, who we think we actually approve delivery of care. Uh, in a proactive fashion rather than wait on a referral basis. And, and within the VA, we have existing platforms such as eConsults and ScanEcho uh, to help facilitate that, that management. I do think we need a lot of facilitation in, in learning about how to coordinate care between primary and specialty care because that's going to be the interface um, and really have an emphasis on population management. So. So I do think this is a this is a complicated issue. Um, I think we all own this issue. I mean, patients own this issue. Uh, pulmonary medicine owns this issue. Primary care owns this issue. Um, the whole healthcare system, I think, owns this issue in terms of uh, framing uh, to improve delivery. We actually have to have policy and and, uh, and emphasis on quality. Uh, as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, I think this has broader implications than uh, COPD alone, um, especially in the environment of the ACA environment, uh, where there's really going to be a strong emphasis on uh, quality per cost. Um, um, and um, I think it's going to be the health system and payers that are actually going to drive these changes. Um, we, they're going to change delivery of care. Uh, really uh, to try to meet the needs of patients, specialists, and primary care to qu really try to coordinate um, toward a more defined common goal as opposed to what, uh, what our current model is. So as in anything, we have a number of acknowledgments. The center has been incredibly supportive of me over time as well as the division. Um, this is my research staff here that, uh, that none of this act would be done without. Uh, and the collaborators uh, in this room include Laura, uh, Lynn Ranke, uh, Ann Melzer, Rich Collins, uh, Minju, uh, Sepa Rene, and Colin Cook. And so uh, with that, I want to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to entertain questions if uh, there are any. Marianne. Thank you. Um, Dr. O, oh, I'm wondering, given the poor uh, penetration of spirometry among the patients, and you mentioned the research is open and the system that we're working under at the VA, um, I'm wondering if there's any thought to either getting spirometry into primary care, like yeah. you do with uh, retinal scanning, and we have other It sounds like they should be relatively straightforward questions, right? I mean, in the simplest, in the simplest sense, right? Unfortunately, it's not right. But in the simplest sense, um, you know, there are spirometers. You, there are held health spirometers that cost a thousand dollars or less that are highly accurate and that should be disseminated. That could be easily disseminated uh, throughout the system. Um, within the VA, there are a little bit, a little bit of other kind of contextual issues about who's going to interpret them, how do you ensure quality, and those kind of things. But, but nonetheless, there is a push. Uh, you know, Rich Stark, when I was at this meeting, who's the, um, who is one of the leaders in primary care, said that you know we should be just be doing that. We should just you know disseminate uh, spirometers. But, but NELAP, you know, the National Health and Education Program actually did that, and spirometry use didn't improve. So we have to do more than just that. We have to actually encourage the use through whatever measures, um, through performance or through encouragement otherwise. Um, there are some other technical things. You know, Vince Fan, for example, was successful in, um, was, uh, successful in getting a spirometer uh, installed at the Mount Vernon Clinic. Uh, but my, you know, my sense is that it took him you know, uh, much more time and energy that, than could be done throughout the entire system. Um, in terms of LABA restrictions, um, um, so llamas, I think the way llamas should go is the way the llamas have gone, right? So llamas have, you have to document their full limitation, and then you have to, um, and then they have to be symptomatic. And those are the only two things you really need to document for the use of an anti a long-acting anticholinergic. And that probably should be our model for uh, llamas as well, because that's probably exactly the same. Yeah. You did a beautiful job of uh, highlighting some of the challenges domestically. I'm sure you 
Andrew is globally, um, COPD is yeah. is uh, a major issue, as was highlighted by the Global Burden of Disease 2010 study that yeah. recently came out of uh, IHME yep. here at U. Um, and globally, actually, we probably ignore this, particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, even more than we do here, mm -hmm. um, except for focusing on tobacco policy. So I'd be really curious about what you think about starting points, particularly in low income countries, yes. for addressing COPD. Yeah, it's not my it's not my expertise. I just want to say that, but you know, my understanding is that really, uh, it's the consumption of biomass, uh, which in, in women in particular that are at highest risk uh, because of the consumption of biomass, and in, in terms of uh, heating uh, heating the uh, you know home environments as well as cooking. Um, the that policy, I think, has to be very different than what we would do here in the United States, which is, you know, that policy probably should be more directed at, um, you know, providing or being able to subsidize um, high efficiency, you know, stoves uh, with ventil with with adequate ventilation. Um, some of obviously we as the United States have a tendency of focusing on tobacco policy because it's it's what. You know, we, um, it's our leading cause of COPD within the United States. Um, but it's clearly an issue in developing countries and even, you know, countries like China, which are, you know, above that, uh, where uh, the consumption of biomass is, is actually the leading driver of COPD. And so, so you have to drive public policy toward those, uh, to those exposures um, uh, to really try to have any kind of meaningful effect. That would be my, um, that would be my guess. But like I said, I'm not an expert. Steve. Looking at the sort of lack of uptake of some of these uh, recommendations, to what extent is it related to the severity of the COPD? So, um, you know, you sort of dichotomized, you know, present absence, but, you know, is it, is it better in people with the more severe airflow obstruction, or, you know, are a lot of these patients with fairly mild to moderate airflow obstruction? So it's clear that the therapy, you know, I think these would be more important in general, in the patients with the more severe. Right. So, I mean, we haven't looked a lot of that. I mean, I think the 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 issue that I was presenting here was really more about, you know, making a correct diagnosis, patients being treated for exacerbations, um, and not actually having, you know, airflow limitation, or even if they're having exacerbations, not then having appropriate escalation of therapy. So it's, it's all going to be dependent on um, on what question you're asking, right? So for the diagnosis one, of course, it's going to be highly related to severity, right? The people who are more severe disease, you're right. You actually probably don't need spirometry, you know, uh, to uh, to diagnose it. Uh, you know, if someone comes in barrel chested, um, long tobacco consumption, that kind of stuff, absolutely. But that's those that's the vast minority of this of the patients in the country being treated for COPD, right? The vast majority of people are are people who actually apparently don't have the disease, right? And so, um, uh, and so I really do think, you know, so I, I think severity matters a lot, but, uh, but in the context of this, I just, I, you know, my emphasis would be just to get spirometry once and make sure that actually, people actually have airflow limitation before we go down the path of figuring out how severe it is. I think that's a different question uh, in some ways. Oh gosh, ending with Chris Goss, that's going to be. Uh... <laughs> in cardiology literature for you know, assessing efficacy of therapies, most of those trials and those therapies have been shown to have improved survival, which I think can really change the decision behavior. But a lot of the COPD data is really not, a, there's no improved survival type of option therapy. Do you think that is one of the dichotomous approaches to the clinicians, why we don't take this seriously in the primary care setting? I'm sure it contributes. I'm sure it contributes. I mean, the reality is that, um, you know, the uh, survival is important, um, but the therapies also for heart failure have better effects on health-related quality of life than they do for COPD, and, and there's no doubt about that. On the other hand, what I showed was the data for exacerbation frequency uh, and hospital rehospitalization, which is is the effect on the effect of these inhaled therapies on exacerbation risk is exactly the same as it is for heart failure re-exacerbation. Now it just so happens that the the path to death 
to, you know, is seems to be independent of those interventions, but um, but it doesn't mean that it's less important to focus on. But I think you're right. I think you know the fact that you know inhaled therapies actually don't really have a great effect on health-related quality of life, right? It's, it's usually measured in in uh, you know two to three points on the St. George's score, where the MID is four points, right? And so um, the fact that it doesn't actually improve mortality, um, you know, doesn't, uh, yeah. It, it, so I mean, the the, the endpoints are narrower than than for um, you know beta blockers, which is a you know you would consider the the triple threat, right? Improves um, you know hospitalizations, uh, health related quality of life, and mortality, right? And so um, so I do think there is there is that barrier. But on the other hand, you know CMS is coming out um, next year with um, you know hospital penalties for COPD, and so um, these seem like relatively low-hanging fruits that we could do to uh, to actually improve delivery of care um, and, and, you know, and avoid penalties <laughs> to the health system. So, um, but um, the one other thing I would point out is that smoking cessation actually has been shown to improve mortality in COPD as well, so don't forget that. <laughs> so, but, all right. Thank you so much.